find verse 7. Reading from the New International Version tonight, we do have notes that will get to you shortly if they're not there just yet. The end of all things is near. Come on, say amen. Therefore, be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. Above all, love each other deeply. How? Deeply. Because love covers a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality one to another without grumbling. Each one of you should use whatever gift he has received to serve others faithfully, administering God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, he should do it as one speaking the very words of God. If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Father, thank you. Move in great power and authority tonight as I teach, as I preach, that you would hide me behind your cross and these lips of clay would utter revelation and truth that transform the hearers, each and every one of us, into the people you want us to be, into the church you want us to be, in the end of time, even the end time church. We thank you and praise you for all those that will listen in the future. Release all that's in your heart tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. For as long as I've been in church, I've heard, you know, the Lord could come back in any moment. How many of you, if you haven't heard that, you got to wonder where you've been going to church. Because the church, ever since it was a church, that's what they've been believing, believing that at any moment, Jesus could come back. Come on, someone say it, at any moment, Jesus could come back. Or should I say, at any moment, the trumpet could sound and we would rapture on out of here. The return of Christ, the second, the second coming is after that in our understanding of doctrine and theology. The early church knew that no one knows the time. Now, if somebody tells you, oh, I know when he's coming, that would be a good indicator that they're a deceiver because no one knows. Scripture says no one knows. No one knows the time. No one knows the hour. He will come like a thief in the night. No one knows. Jesus did say that you'll, you'll, you'll see the seasons. You can know the seasons and the time. And We all sense, I mean, from my earliest memory as a child, I always had this sense and awe that something phenomenal was going to happen during my lifetime. And, you know, I used to think that that was just, you know, maybe visions of grandeur of a, of a boy. But in actual fact, I know now it to be the seeds of heaven placed in my life with an expectancy that something awesome is on the horizon. And the older I get, and though I'm not as old as my brother, the older I get, the more I realize that we are closer to the end than, any, than ever before we're closer to the end. This text is a... Uh, a text that's made a big, big impact. I've heard Dr. Morocco preach it many times. And it's so profound. Does anybody know why Jesus hasn't come back yet? I'll tell you. And it's right from the Word. 2 Peter chapter 3, go there. I'm going to hold the place of a, a teacher that will probably get on fire and start preaching. That's probably what's going to happen. That's usually what happens. We go back and forth from teaching to preaching Here's why Jesus has not returned, 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. For the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and the heavens will disappear with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with fire, and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. I could, I suppose, put this message into the category of the end is the beginning series that I preach from time to time 
as the Lord leads me. I had a dream. And in my dream, I saw all of humanity in the earth. I was standing there before them. And I knew that there was just a few moments and the end was, was upon us. I knew that my life in the earth was over. And I knew everyone's life there was also over. You know, it's a dream. So you know stuff. And then from the east, I was funny. I was telling somebody this story. How do you know it's from the east? I mean, it's my dream, dude. It's from the east. You want me to prove to you? All right, anyway. So from the east, I saw this bright light. And just, we're gone, and we all go to heaven, those who were there. I'm telling you, the end of all things is near. And that's what Peter said, and the church has believed that since the church was birthed. Since Jesus' resurrection and ascension, the end of all things has been at hand. He said, well, when is the end? Soon. And the church has said that. For a millennium, for 2,000 years, the church has said the same thing. That's why it's in the text that we read right here. The end of all things is near. See, the enemy would love to destroy us. The, love, the, the enemy would love to destroy us individually. They'd love to destroy us corporately. They would love to get us into a place of apathy. They get us into a place of blindedness where we don't understand the time and the seasons. But I believe like the sons of Issachar knew the times and seasons that God is raising up a church in Wasilla, Alaska and beyond to know the times and the seasons that we're in and to be prepared because the end of all things is near. I want you to tell your neighbor, dude, the end of all things is near. Go ahead, tell him. There's three characteristics of the end time church found right in this text. Look at verse 7. I mean, it's kind of unusual because the end of all things is near. It's not, he doesn't say go out and, 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 and fill your garage with flour and sugar. That's not what he says. He doesn't say go and stockpile all your food. Listen, I, don't, I, I believe that the Lord's going to come in my lifetime. But if he comes many generations from now, the church is supposed to live this way anyway. You're supposed to live like he's coming at any moment. By the end of this service, the rapture could happen, and that is theologically accurate. Nothing else needs to happen. It could just boom. Some of you wouldn't go past the roof, so praise God we're having church tonight. So he said the end of all things is near, and then he gives instructions. So therefore, when, the, when you see something, it says therefore, you have to ask what it's there for. The end of all things is near, Therefore, look at verse 7. Therefore, be clear-minded and self-controlled huh? so that you can pray. So that you can what? Is it really that important? Is it really that important? Well, according to Peter, it is that prayer is so important. The end of all things is near, so be clear-minded, self-controlled so you can pray. The end time church is a praying church. And I'll tell you, any church that doesn't have a prayer movement just might not be one of those end time churches. I'm not trying to poke fun. I'm not here to analyze the body of Christ and throw rocks for God's sake. It's hard enough to, to get my own carcass out of bed to come to prayer. I'm not going to poke fun at anybody else, but I do understand clearly, clearly in the word, the end time church is a praying church. That's what that says. So we have many pastors that watch this broadcast and are listening, perhaps even now, certainly later on. It's across America quite late in the East Coast. So I'm just telling you, pastor, you can't delegate your prayer life, sir, ma'am. You can't do that. And if you're leading a group of people, you had better have a corporate time of prayer. Well, we have it once on Saturday. It's not enough. No, it's not. not if you're going to make a difference. Let's all have a praise break because you guys got nervous for a second. The praying church. Fill in your notes. You must be clear-minded and self-controlled. That is a sound mind that comes from knowing the Lord's word, God's word, having wisdom, and being spiritually alert. Being spiritually alert. You know, the baptism tank was interesting tonight. Uh, it, it, the Lord does things in my life in a way to, I don't know, you know, prophetic people see things prophetically. 
That tank, that water was so stinking hot. And I didn't, I usually, I usually feel the tank. I think I put my foot in it and gave it a little bit of a whisk. You know, I mean, is that a word? Whisking? Yes, I think so. I whisked the baptism tank with my foot. And I'm accustomed in 15 years of baptizing to have very cold water, uh, although in recent years it's been warmer. Never has it been as hot as it is tonight. The system's working really good. So I whisked it, and I felt, I felt that it was hot, but usually it's a layer of heat on the top, and it's ice cold below. So usually what I do is that I get in and I swish that thing around and I get it, you know, the right temperature. I blend the tank. Now, you might not have been paying attention, but when I got in to blend the tank, there was no blending to be done because it was 120 at the top and all the way to the bottom. And when I realized this is not cooling off, I hurry up and got out and my legs are still tingling. I'm so thankful it was me. I wasn't one of my staff. You know, you need to be alert. You need to be awake. You need to not be asleep in the arms of the enemy to be clear-minded, self-controlled, self-controlled. If you're not self-controlled, somebody else is going to be controlling you. Having wisdom, knowing the word, being spiritually alert. You know, I think Peter really understood this because he was in the garden when Jesus said, come, let's pray. Pray with me, tarry with me for an hour. And he's like, (laughs) sleeping. He sleeps for an hour instead of, and you know what happens in the garden. I think Peter understood this. He was a person living at the end of time when he wrote this, and we are a people living at the end of time. Be self-controlled. Peter defined that in 1 Peter. Go there, 1 Peter chapter 1. Just back a couple chapters. And verse 13. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober. See, there's a lot of people I have to stop and say, many people aren't really active in prayer, in the house of prayer, and alert because you're intoxicated. You're intoxicated perhaps with food. Intoxicated by money. Uh, You can be intoxicated by more than pharmacia, more than alcohol, more than marijuana. You can be intoxicated by anything. And the crazy thing is we have a whole world that's intoxicated. I've seen people intoxicated by the news. I've seen people intoxicated with money, with work, with sex, with music. Don't be intoxicated by anything. The apostle Paul said, don't be drunk with wine in excess, but be filled with the spirit. You should be so in love with God. You know who you should be intoxicated with? You should be intoxicated with the one who saved you. You should be so in love with God. You're singing songs and walking with him like Adam walked in the cool of the day. Don't be intoxicated by power. Don't be intoxicated by sex. Don't be intoxicated by money. Don't be intoxicated by anything but the Lord God Almighty. Can you say yes? And that in this day and age requires effort. Because there's a lot of things that want to come to steal your affection. If you fall in love with Jesus and you cultivate that love, then you will have a cultivated prayer life. These are marks of the end time church. The end time church is a praying church. Clear minded, self controlled. Be self controlled. The end time church is a loving church. It's a what? It's a loving church. (laughs) Somebody said to me, Uh, Over the weekend, I think it was at the men's encounter. I've been to a lot of churches, but when I walked into this place, I just felt like people accepted me and loved me. And for that, I commend you. You have done that. That's not something I've done personally, although I try to. My staff tries to. But how many of you know you are the church? We're the church together. When people meet you, are you sour and miserable? Are you filled with love and helping them? And apparently this person had a good experience. And I've heard that over and over. The end time church is a loving church. To love deeply. The Greek there means to be fully stretched. Um, I want to say that there's things about people 
that I don't like too much. Shoot, there's things about me I don't like too much. And there might be things about me that you don't like too much. Just pray a lot. Amen. The Lord will help me. And I'm praying for you as well. But when you're filled with the love of God, when there's love in your heart, you know, you're going to be open to help people that are maybe a little unusual or maybe people that are mean. I can't wait to have the conversation with this giant man at the gym that I talked about last week because I'm just going to do my very best to love him even though I feel like he hates me. Do you know anybody that maybe they hate you? The good news is there's at least two or three people statistically that love you. Reach out and love people. (laughs) Come on, someone say love people. Love deeply, deep stretch. Yeah, it's a stretch to love. It's easy to love people that are nice to you. It's not so easy to love people that smell and are mean and are ugly and spit on you and want to take advantage of you. Those people are not easy to love. The end time church is a church that loves deeply. Verse 8, look at verse 8 with me. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. This is profound here. Love covers a multitude of sins. When you're reading scripture and you come across things like that, learn to, learn to find out where, that else, where else is that in scripture. And this love covers a multitude of sins is found in verse uh 12 of Proverbs 10, and you can go there. It's found in a couple places. It's found in James as well. Proverbs 10, verse 12 says, Hate stirs up strife, but love covers all sins. See, that's a love that doesn't focus on the bad, on the evil, but focuses on the good. It focuses on the good. It's easy to focus on evil. Love covers a multitude of sins as a love that's focused on that which is good, not bad. James 5, this is right in your notes now, verse 19 and 20. Brethren and sistren. It, it doesn't say that, I'm just... Sounds a little bit too much, too much like sistren. If anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and love, and pardon me, and cover a multitude of sins. See, it's, you know what this is talking about? When you really love someone, you're going you're gonna to follow up on them. You're going to call them. You're going to stop by their house and see how they're doing. You're going to care enough to drop off a meal, drop off a loaf of bread. You're going to care enough to love them, to reach out to them, to bring them back. This is, this is a love that, that wants people to serve God and is willing to go to the ends, really, to bring them back. There's so many people that are not in church. And I understand there's fear of COVID and all of that. But so many people, as a habit of then being isolated over these last year and a half, never got back into the house. So how are they going to find their way back? We have a whole department called a connect department, literally a whole department dedicated to following up on people that have not been here. Seriously? Yes. That's very unusual. In most churches, that's not the case. And again, to my pastors online and those that are listening, I would highly advise you put a lot of effort to go out on on a dark and a cloudy day like Jesus did. Be the good shepherd and reach people, love people, bring them back. Because love will cover a multitude of sins. That's what he's talking about. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, do not behave rudely. Oh, well, oops. Do not seek its own. Love does not seek its own. It's not provoked. It thinks no evil. Love doesn't keep score. Go to Matthew 18. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him. Not you, him, Facebook. Not you, him, Instagram. Not you, him, and uh, some other social media platform. Just you and him or her. Your brother sins against you, you go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you've gained your brother. But if he'll not hear you, take 
with you one or two more that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. If he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. Now that's not like, I've actually had people say, I talked to him, I brought someone and I'm now ready to stand in front of the congregation and tell everybody. I said, no, that's not happening. Okay. That doesn't mean that. It means to tell it to church authority and then we will help you. And it's one, you know, I think mediation should happen in a church before it goes to the court. And then, you know, there are times where you need the court because people are stubborn and greedy. Generally speaking, nobody here, of course. Love will confront people. You know, if you don't confront things, you're going to have the devil running your life. You don't confront things in your family, in your marriage, you're going to have, you're going to have darkness. If you don't confront things in your business, your business is going to have problems. There was a favorite rest- restaurant of mine a while back, a while back, and uh, the food went downhill. So as it was going downhill, being a favorite restaurant of mine, wanting to help, I made, I let them know lovingly, your food's going downhill. You know, I'm paraphrasing and making it simple. Why? Because I wanted to care enough so that their business, could, you know, I'm not sure they listened. I don't know, I haven't been back. I went back a couple other times. It was the same thing. I'm not going there anymore. If your life was jacked up, wouldn't you want somebody to love you enough to tell you? Don't, you know, did you ever get a piece of lettuce in your teeth? Somebody were like, you got a little something. You know, ladies, when you get lipstick on your teeth, isn't it nice that a friend is like, love will confront people. Offer hospitality without grumbling, verse 9. We're talking about the church at the end of time. The end time church. And we are in the end. The end time church has three characteristics right from 1 Peter chapter 4. is a praying church, self-controlled. It's a, it's a loving church. Come on, someone say we're going to be a loving church. Offer hospitality is an aspect of being a loving church without grumbling. They said without grumbling. Some of you offer hospitality, and then when they, they're like, oh, I can't wait till they leave. You know, some of you have the gift of hospitality, and if you'll allow the Lord to use that, it'll make a huge difference. We're a personal church. And, you know, you might not have thought about this, but let, let, me, let me bring it to your attention. The church in the first century didn't have beautiful buildings like we have. They didn't have this. They didn't have a, like a facility we have on the hill. They didn't have that. They met in three places. They met in the synagogue. They met in, they met in homes. And, and they met at the temple. All right, It's really three places. I mean, they could meet outside. They would rent halls. Tyrannous Hall was a, a rental. And they would meet and gather. But mostly, did you know mostly they met in homes? Did you know that? Early on, the early church, and then buildings came about, and, but the early church met in homes. Where did they meet? So can you imagine if people were not, did not have hospitality? Now, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but when's the last time you took somebody to lunch or invited somebody over or took somebody out for coffee? A church that doesn't have hospitality is in trouble. We need to, we need to care for each other, love one another. You know, some of you need to open your home. I think Pastor Ann was here. Pastor Ann has an amazing gift for encouraging people to open their homes who don't want to. It's because she just has a way of showing you how important it is. And then when people open their homes, it's like Obed-Edom and the ark moving into the house. I have seen this over and over and over. People that open their homes for life groups, uh, for these small groups that we have, It's like the Ark of the Covenant comes in their house and it rains on them. And supernatural things happen. Now that should happen in the life of a believer anyway. But really the truth is when you begin to allow for your gifts, which I'm going to talk about here for serving, you allow for those gifts to roll through you. It's God's power begins to move in your life in a way that it didn't before. Some of you need to open your homes. Why? Because we need to offer hospitality. We're the end time church. If we're not hospitable, who's going to be?
We can be the end time church that'll thrive. We've got, a people, we've got to be a people that love. We've got to be a personal church. The third thing you'll see as I don't preach to you too long tonight, although there's no telling what will happen in the remaining portions of the service. A serving church. A serving church. We're supposed to be a church that serves. Come on, someone say amen. Look at offer hospitality one to another without grumbling. Each one of you should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, to serve others faithfully, administering God's grace in its various forms. That is so profound because everyone here, no matter what age you are, come on, where's all the little kids? Say, hey. Everybody say, say hey. Everyone has gifts from the youngest to the oldest here. I, I saw prophetically an army of gray-haired retirees. The classics. I saw an army of classics being raised up. You got more time on your hands. You have more wisdom than everybody else. God's going to use God's going to use you here. And I'm going to tell you, we need you. We need your help. We need your wisdom. Amen. Let the younger people do all the hard lifting and you just come and serve and use the gifts that God's given you. If you'll use the gifts that God's given you, you will release God's grace. God's grace is more powerful than anything else in the world. Whoa. Come on, lift your hands to Jesus. Say, I'm going to use my gifts. I love Edna and Noel in their 80s, serving God with your hair on fire, running for borough mayor. I do believe, I do believe, I do believe you're going to win. I pray you win. Are you getting political? Sure. Vote for Mayor Edna for borough mayor. There. Why? She's a woman of God. Stellar, stellar woman of God, great man of God. In your 80s, you don't have to run for anything. Why would you run for anything? I, I don't even have to ask her. I know, the, I know the reason. Because we need godly leadership. If ever we needed godly leadership, we need it now. She could rest and, you know, work her garden and, you know, travel to, I don't know, some sunny place in the winter. No. In their 80s, running for office. Who's going to... Not, not that you need to have anybody take your place, but I'm saying, where, where's the people in the 50s and their 40s and their 30s running for? Where are the people that are going to serve in our community in the areas of influence if we don't put people in office? Come on! Let's go! Somebody thought I was going to say Brandon, but I ain't going to say that. Let's make a difference! Let's make, come on, someone say, let's go. Get involved, serve, serve. Not just in the community, in the house of the Lord. Everyone using their God-given gifts to serve others. The concept is profoundly Christian and bizarre for first century people to hear. Nobody served anybody in the first century. You had slaves and you definitely weren't gonna go the extra mile Turn the other cheek. That, that Jesus brought this revolutionary thinking. He said, I didn't come to be served, but I came to serve. That is a revolutionary idea. We just take it for granted right now in 2021, even though many people are serving themselves. God wants to raise up and bring forth what I'm going to call a servolution. A revolution of pe people serving others. People put it throwing in to make a difference in the community, in the house of the Lord. Can you say amen? When we use our gifts, I'm writing your notes, when we use our gifts that God's grace is being expressed and we're being faithful. Now the thing that's terrifying to me is when you don't use your gifts, that means you shut off. Okay, Minister Tammy, where are you? Minister Tammy is part-time staff and works 60 hours a week or something. Some works so hard. She's part-time staff working full-time. 
if you didn't use the gifts that you have, what would happen? If, if Minister Tammy, let's just take her for example because she touches hundreds and maybe thousands of people, okay? And her department. So if she didn't use her gift, what if she just said, you know something, I'm sick and tired of this. I just don't want to do this. I just want to garden and I want to watch my granddaughter swim and I don't want to do this anymore. So I'm not going to do this anymore. What would happen? Then that, that flow of God's grace, the flow of God's power, the anointing that flows through her to touch you, to touch so many, would be literally shut off. It would be like a valve got stopped and that release of God's power that we're usually not mindful of the effect that it has. The release of God's power would be shut off. What would happen if you just no longer wanted to be a part of the security or ushers or greeters or if, if Toby, where's Toby at? Toby in the house somewhere? What would happen if Brother Toby just said, you know something, I just don't feel like doing worship anymore. Well, then Minister Mike could step up. And then what would happen if Minister Mike had said, you know, I feel led not to do that anymore. Who would, I, who would we lead worship? would have somebody else. But what if they didn't want to serve? You see, we don't understand the flow of God's power through us. You think you can just quit or not get involved. Are you listening to me? Are you listening? Come on, listen to your crazy bald head pastor tonight. How about those that have gifts but haven't cracked open the faucet? So there's literally a flow of God's power that'll come through you if you'll get involved, if you'll have, be a part of the servolution, if you'll crack the valve and allow God to you. But my gifts really aren't all that many. Your gifts are bigger than you know. It's a reasonable thing to do considering what he's done for you. And the blessing that's released... The Lord's trying to use you, but you got to plug in. Go to the Discover track. Go through the Discover track. Go through the Foundations class. Get plugged into a life group. Like, I'm so encouraged at the amount of people that are helping with Pumpkin Patch. Watch what God does for every one of them. We've seen it over and over again. Sometimes I feel like Moses trying to convince people, twisting arms. He's really good. Serve him. And I just want to hit the rock and be like, Man! I'm trying to get you blessed. I'm not trying to get something from you. I'm trying to get something to you. I'm trying to wake you up to the fact that God made you to be alive at this hour of history and that which he's put on the inside of you will change lives. It'll change lives. You say, well, I feel insignificant. It's a lie. It's a lie from hell. Together we make the body. How insignificant is a thumb? Try not using yours. We all need to function together. Can you imagine if 10% of your body wasn't working? Now you look at the church, and I'm in the church, the church worldwide, the church universal. And I understand here we have more people serving than maybe in other places, statistically. It's not a competition. I think the reason is, is we're constantly firing you up and preaching messages like this and telling you, get involved. Because when you stand before the Lord at the end of the age, when you stand before the judgment seat of Christ, you don't want to hear, oh, what happened? What, what, what happened? You don't want to hear, well done. I gave you my void. I gave you my spirit. What happened? We're all going to be judged. We give an account for how we've lived in this world. And there's rewards. Oh, rewards. I don't really fully understand that, but I like getting rewarded. Come on, does anybody else like getting rewarded? It's time for a servolution. Would you say that? It's time for a... You say, well, they've got enough people helping. That's not the point. You need to serve for you to find a place of significance. 
I believe that we're going to have so many volunteers, such a servolution, Pastor Kirsten, Pastor Kimmy, that we'll have to have Team A, Team B, Team C, and Team D. And Team A can serve on the first week of the month. Team B can serve on the second week. Team C can serve on the third week. And Team D can serve on the fourth week. And on the fifth week, we'll have a random selection when there are five weeks. I believe that we could have so many worship teams, so many life group leaders. All that has to happen is that you awaken to the reality that we're at the end of the age, the end of all things is near. Be clear-minded, self-controlled, and use your gifts. What gifts? Whatever he's put on you. And I honestly didn't think I had any. When I came in, I didn't think I had any gifts. So you're looking at somebody that clearly, in my mind, I had no gifts. I had a great gift of lying, but I knew that didn't work too good in the kingdom. Liars go to hell, so I wasn't going to be using that. I had a fantastic manipulative gift. I could manipulate people. I could lie. And I could look good. No, I'm just kidding. I didn't think I had anything. And then when I began to serve, I began to see fruit coming forth from my life. And honestly, I still pinch myself. I'm trying to say anything about myself other than don't you let the devil lie to you like he lied to me. It took me a few years to really plug in and get involved. The grace of God will be released through you. Peter sees the gifts, God's gifts in two ways, speaking and serving. Speaking and serving. Words and deeds. Speak, when you're speaking, you speak with the consciousness that you're God's mouthpiece. Oh, God, I'm getting convicted right now. Let's repent. Lord, forgive me for where I was not your mouthpiece. And I was my own mouthpiece. Forgive me, God, for pride. Forgive me where I didn't yield to be your voice. If you'll, if you'll think about that, you raise your awareness that when you're speaking, you're supposed to speak as a very oracle of God. Come on, someone say, help me. I'm not the only one. I've heard some of you guys talk. Excuse my French. It's not French. Serving God's strength. Worship team, serve in God's strength. God will give you strength. You know, I've, this is quite a weekend, this weekend. I don't know, I, don't, I have to count how many messages this is. I think it's my sixth time preaching, maybe seven, six, seven, in two days. I heard someone say, when you preach one message, it's like an eight-hour labor day. That's not true. That was some pastor that wants you to make you think that's what it's like. That's, that's, that's not the way it is. <laughs> it does take something out of you, for sure, spiritually. I'm tired. I'm taking off tomorrow. I'm, I'm tired. I am. Usually when I'm tired, I teach. <laughs> but you know what I've found? That you can do more than you think you can. And it's been modeled before us by our own Dr. Morocco and so many others that have gone before us. You know, there's, there's strength that God will give you if you'll say yes. And you move forward. And you know, it's easy to sit on your couch and watch Netflix. Instead, get up, come to a meeting, a pumpkin patch, get in a hot suit walk around and act like a fool so you can entertain kids so that somehow their hearts will be open so that they hear the love of Jesus. You sit at your bed at night. You will never regret that. The Lord sees everything that we do. And I'm telling you, even though you feel weak and tired at times, He will give you strength to be able to do what He called you to do. Don't turn the valve off. And the end of time, be, let, let's be this kind of a church that in everything God is to be praised, the final, the final blank. Come on, let's just review. The end time church is a church of praise. Three characteristics. Verse seven, it's a praying church. Clear-minded, self-controlled so you can pray. How's your prayer life? We have morning times of prayer. Tomorrow morning, good time to start. 
Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday now. There's, there's men's group praying. There's a women's group that's praying. Right here, 7 o'clock in the morning. Come, be a part of it. You said, well, I can't get there. I'm driving to Anchorage. Put it on your phone instead of, instead of watching the latest run of Scooby-Doo. Put it on your phone. Give yourselves, carve out time to pray. Why? Because the end of all things is near. Make sure that you're self-controlled, that you're alert. A loving church. Come on, we're going to be a loving church. You know, Hebrews talks about people who have ministered to angels unaware. I can tell you stories, mind-blowing stories. You don't know when an angel is going to visit you just to test you out. See what's going on. See if you'll love them and care for them. Love, would you love people? Would you do some random act of kindness to someone this week? Pay for their coffee? That's an amazing thing to do. Amen. Coffee's expensive these days. Tell somebody that God loves them. Share the love of God. Invite people to church. Go the extra mile. Be, get, bring, bring food to our Thanksgiving giveaway thing. We need, we need food. We need turkeys. We need all kinds of stuff. Isn't that right, Pastor Kirsten? All the candy in? We're close on 1,500 pounds of candy. Well done. Serve. I look over, I see Mayor Edna and Noel. So get involved in the community. Listen, some of you need to be a part of the Rotary Club, Lions Club. Plug in and some extra thing out there. Why? So that you can meet people, so that you can invite them and bring them into the, into the house, so that they can hear the good news of Jesus, so they can get born again, so that they can become the praying end time church, so they can become part of the servolution, so that we can change our state, so that we can change our nation. Can you say yes? Can you say a better yes? Love people deeply, and I know that's hard. I know it can be hard. Love people. Love the unlovable. Love covers a multitude of sins. Just reviewing. Offer hospitality. Can you say amen? Be a serving church. Number three, everyone has God-given gifts. Use them in this place. I plead with you. Why? Because God's trying to get something from you. Pardon me, to you, not from you. God's trying to get something to you. God's trying to bless you. I'm just telling you, we don't need your help. That's not what it's about. Change your whole mindset. Well, the church needs my help. No, you knucklehead. You need to serve because it does something in your life. It releases God's power to touch and change people. You'll lie in your bed at night and be like, "Woo, oh God, you're, you have a sense of satisfaction and purpose and fulfillment that you will never find any other way. Grace of God, speaking, serving, words and deeds. Thanks for listening to this message today. If the Holy Spirit is speaking to you and you realize that you need Jesus as your Savior and you'd like to pray with me to either commit your life to Jesus for the first time or rededicate your life to the Lord, repeat this prayer after me. Father God, thank you for sending your son Jesus to die for my sins. Jesus, thank you for dying for me and bringing me forgiveness. I'm sorry for my sins. I repent of them today and I ask you to cleanse me and wash me of all my sin. I commit to live for you all the rest of the days of my life. And I pray this in your name, Jesus, amen. If you prayed that prayer today, would you text the word SAVED to 907-357-2065? We'd like to send you some information and some materials that will help you in your Christian walk. God bless.